Hello everyone, Top Hat Waffle here. Once again, we're going to continue working on our Counter-Strike Global Offensive competitive level. We briefly touched on game modes before. Today I want to show you guys how to set up a CS level with Hostage Rescue, and then we'll focus again on the Diffusal game mode aspect. Then we'll wrap up with creating our own custom radar for playtesting and then shipping purposes. We'll start out like always by going to the tools section on Steam, loading up the Counter-Strike Global Offensive SDK, from there loading Hammer World Editor. I already have it open on my taskbar to save a few seconds of time. We're going to pretend that Metro is a hostage map just for the implementation of hostages. We'll make Bombsite A be a hostage site. If we press Shift E to select our entity tool and then place a new entity on the ground, Double click on it to open its object properties. Let's change its class to Hostage Entity. When we apply the changes, we'll get the classic Counter-Strike Source Hostage Model. There's a few key values that we can change to affect how hostages spawn in our level. The Hostage Model setting is no longer used, so you can't pick the model anymore. You'll always get the bound orange jumpsuit hostage model. The Hostage Spawn Int Factor determines how likely a hostage is chosen to be spawned there. You can control if a hostage point should be used more or less often than others. We also have hostage spawn exclusion groups, and we have up to 30 of them. The game will automatically choose two spawns for a hostage, and we want to make sure that two spawn not next to each other. To do this in example, if I place a hostage entity here and another one over here by this bench, if I select them both and add them to the Hostage Exclusion Group 1 under Do Not Spawn Together, when the game picks what hostages to spawn, it will not pick these two. Just like player spawns, we want to raise the entities up above the ground so they don't fall through. If your hostages aren't there, they've probably fallen down and are out of the level. Let's copy both of these, and we'll just paste them up here in middle, move them off to the side, and then raise them up. I'll press Alt-Enter to open the object properties, and all I want to change here is Exclusion Group 1 to NA, and Exclusion Group 2 to Do Not Spawn Together. This will make it so when the game picks the hostage spawns, it will pick one from each of these groups. It will not spawn these two together, it will not spawn these two together. You can have as many hostage spawn points as you want in your level, but the game will only pick two. Lastly, we need to add a hostage rescue zone so the hostages can actually be secured. This is typically over at CT Spawn, so if we fly over there, go to our texture browser, and type in Triggered, we can select our Triggered Texture. If we select our Block Tool by pressing Shift B, and create a new block inside of CT Spawn that the hostages can be rescued at, then pressing Ctrl T to turn it into an entity, and changing its class to Function Hostage Rescue. We don't need to change any settings here, you can have as many of these in your map as you want. A CT just has to bring a hostage into one of these volumes for them to count as rescued. Let's compile the level so we can see what it looks like in-game. With the game loaded, press the tilde key to open the console, type map and your map name, which is CS Metro in my case. I'll spawn in as a CT, get rid of the bots, and we can see that we have one hostage at each middle and down at A. We can see this by the points on the radar. If I grab this hostage here, and then hoof it back to the rescue zone, that hostage has been rescued and the counter-terrorists have won the round. You'll notice that the game automatically takes care of the radar object placement, such as the H to denote the hostage rescue spawn, along with the arrows to the hostage objectives in the world. This doesn't come into play right now, but it will later once we create our own custom radar. Back over to Hammer, we'll go ahead and start with the diffusal part. This level has undergone some changes after some play testing. I won't bore you with those details, but let's create the first bomb zone here. Since this is bomb site A, I want to create this volume first. We'll just use the block tool again and create a volume. I have the small outline of where the plant zone should be here and it has a small cut here. The bomb volume does not have to be square, and it can consist of multiple brushes, which we'll demonstrate on Bombsite B. I'm going to use the clipping tool here to cut this corner off. 
we can press control T to tie to an entity, change it to a funk bomb target, click apply, and there we go. Let's head on over to B, and we have this sort of weird shape for the bomb region. If we start by creating our volume over this block here, we now need to create another block right here. So I have two different triggers that will be used for the singular bomb site. We'll clip the corner off this to fully recreate that shape. Now using the selection tool, I can select both of these and then press Control T to tie them both to a singular entity. Change their class to function bomb target again and that will be bomb site B. You can tie multiple brush objects to the same entity if you select them all at once and then press Control T. So if I try to select just one of these boxes, I won't be able to do that. This is where our selection modes over on the right will come in handy. If I needed to edit this volume only and wanted to leave this one alone, I could switch my selection mode to solids, which will then let me individually reach into this entity to edit the individual solid objects. One thing to remember when you're in this mode is that when you open the object properties, everything will show as a solid with six faces. This can be confusing if you're trying to troubleshoot leaks later on. So the first thing to check if you think that this should be a bomb site and it's showing as a solid, make sure that you have groups selected instead. Now let's go on to creating the radar for the level. The first step is to get a fresh compile of our map. With the game loaded, let's open up our level by using the map and then our map name command. From here, go ahead and kick all the bots and then no clip to approximately the center of your map. There's a few things that we need to do to set up to be able to actually take the screenshot. The first being to set our game resolution to four by three. You don't want to skip this step if you do, the radar won't align properly. So if we go to our game options in video, under aspect ratio, change it to four by three and then 1280 by 1024. This will be a square image that's 1024 by 1024. We base it off of the height in the resolution. If your monitor does not support 1280 by 1024, you can use 1024 by 768 instead. I'll switch to 1280 by 1024 and click apply, and then open our console and type r underscore no viz space one. This command will disable the rendering engine, preventing any of the level from not being rendered when we're too far away from it. We now need to disable our HUD so we can take a clean screenshot. But before we do that, let's go ahead and download the radar template file. This has the screenshot information in it, along with some plugin download links that we'll need later. So if we go to tophatwaffle.com slash downloads, we can scroll down to the tools section and CSGO radar template. This is just a text file. Let's select the entire thing and copy it into a blank text document. Up at the top, we'll see bind for screenshots. If you want to bind it, cool. If not, copy the console commands here and then let's paste them into our console and that should hide our entire HUD. Next, we need to turn on the overview marker that will determine where we need to place our level when we take the screenshot. Opening our console again and typing CL underscore level overview marker 1024. If you're using 1024 by 768, this will be CL level overview marker 768. This will now place a red line across our screen at the 1024 pixel mark. On the left side of that red line is a perfect 1024 square image. Open our console again, and we'll now turn on the overview scale. If we type CL level overview and then a number, I'll arbitrarily choose four. This will turn our view into the mode that we use to take a screenshot. This is obviously not a good enough scale to capture our entire level. Let's open the console again and raise that value. The level pretty much fits in there now, but if we move to the right, just by using the A and D keys, we can make it a little bit bigger. So by lowering the scale, it should get slightly more full. This actually looks like a good scale, even though some of it's missing. We just need to adjust our height value. So if we turn the overview off by using zero, if we look down at the ground and then just back up on the Z axis, so we're flying away from our level and we turn the overview back on, that actually looks pretty good. And if you turn off the overview again and then go forward or back, 
you'll be able to position the level where you need it to be on the left side of this red line. I'm pretty happy with this, so we need to collect some information from our console before we take our screenshot. Every time we move, we get an update containing our X and Y position along with the scale that we're using. We want to copy the last line out of here, and we'll save it into our radar file. Add two forward slashes for a comment and just save it there. Next, type get POS. This will return the set POS command that will allow you to set your position back to this location in case you ever need to update the screenshot. We'll also save this into our template. We'll end up using this to grab the second height variation of our radar as well. We'll now type JPEG space radar and then I'll give it the map name, space 100. This is telling it to save us a JPEG named Radar Metro with the quality of 100. Click Submit, and we'll see that we get the radar saved to our screenshots folder. After the Nuke update, we're allowed to have multiple heights in our radar. In this instance, I'll have a lower radar image that will contain just the Metro tracks in Bombsite A. I'll end up using this set POS command that we collected earlier to adjust my Z axis. The readout of this command is this sets our X, Y, and Z position and our X, Y, and Z angle that we're looking at. I just need to adjust this last value to show or hide parts of the map that I want shown or hidden. If I paste that in here, I should be able to just take this one off. So now I'll be at 397 height instead of 1397. If I hit that, most of the level disappears. I'm pretty happy with this and I'll do some touch up work in Photoshop. I'll open the console and then I'll arrow key up to JPEG Radar Metro and then I'll just add a lower after it. Hit submit and we'll get the screenshot. If we exit out of the game, after a moment, Steam should give us the option. If we click show on disk, it will open the screenshot folder and we can copy these to our desktop. We'll keep those there for now and we just need to do some photo editing to them to actually get them in the game. CSGO expects that we're going to save these as a DDS image file. We need a plugin to use with Photoshop to be able to save as a DDS file. I've included the link to the texture tools from NVIDIA that will allow us to save as a DDS from Photoshop. If we download these tools here, once the download's complete, we can just install it. You can next through the entire installation. Once it's done, we don't need to view the PDF files. We can close out of our web browser and then open up Photoshop. We can now drag in our two files and we just need to do a small amount of cleanup to these. If we go to image and then canvas size, we'll want to adjust this to be a square image. So we'll anchor left and then change our width to 1024. Click proceed and this is the basic radar. There's a small amount of information that we need to gather from here to be able to find our bomb sites and CT spawns to place on the radar overview. If we turn on the info overlay, make sure our ruler is enabled right click on it and set it to percent. As we move our mouse, we'll get an XY percent value that changes. We are going to use this value to determine where the bomb sites are on this image. If I hover my mouse over bomb site A, I can see that it's 76 and percent X and 51.6% Y. Going to the radar overview, we can set bomb site A by removing the comments and we set our X and Y positions. So again, those were 76, and 51. Make sure to put it as a decimal because this is a value 0 through 1. So 76% 0.76. Bomb site B is located at 1934. So we'll set that to 0.19 and 0.34. If you're creating a hostage level you can also determine where those are here. We'll do the same thing for CT and T spawn 4831 and T spawn is at 4586. Now let's fill out a bit more information about our level and its height. At the top where it says map name, enter your map name. Same thing for material overviews map name. We're then asked for a position X, Y, and scale. This information was given to us from that last output that we used when we turned on our overview scale. So our scale is 5.7, our X coordinate is negative 2856, and our Y coordinate is 4475. Let's save this file into our CSGO directory. Inside CSGO, you'll want to navigate into Resource, Overview. Inside this folder are all the default radars for maps that are included with CSGO. Let's save this as just our map name.txt. 
Now let's determine the vertical section. These were added with the Nuke update that allows our radar to switch between two images depending on our z-axis height in the level. We'll use the default one for the radar that will be the default image, which we'll read from map name underscore radar. We're not going to use the higher option, so we can just delete that. We'll use the lower one. This will read from map name underscore lower radar. We need to determine the height at which this change is at. Let's open our level in Hammer, open our texture browser, and search for skip. Skip is a tool texture that's completely removed when the level compiles. We're just going to use it for measurement purposes. I'll create a brush that spans the entire level, and I want to focus on the horizontal teal line in my side view. This represents the zero height in the level. I want to use this skip brush to determine at what point my radar should switch. So I'll position it underneath, and right now, the bottom of this skip brush will be 16 units, and that's where the radar will change. I think that's pretty good, so we just need to adjust our values inside of the text file. Our altitude min for the default file is going to become 15, and our altitude max for the lower file will be 16. Since we've removed the higher segment, we'll also want to change our altitude max of the default one to 10,000. This is just an obscenely high value that we use, so it always uses this file or the other one. We can save that, and let's go back to Photoshop. There is no quick and easy way to make your radar look like it was on a piece of old paper like some of the valve maps are. That takes a couple hours in Photoshop and a decent amount of know-how. I've done a quick bit of shading on the bomb sites and TNCT spawn here just so it looks more like a regular radar. This is obviously a quick and dirty implementation, but it's good enough for playtesting and if you spend more time on it when you're about to actually ship your level, you'll get a much better result. Now let's work on the lower radar. This is what we have. We'll once again need to open our canvas settings, anchor to our left, and then clip it to 1024 squared. Next, I'll unlock this layer, and I'll do a quick edit to it to have it so the effect is the upper area of the map will fade out once we go down. Again, a lot of this is just knowing how to do photo editing, and you'll pick that up more as you do it, just like level design. Now let's save the files so they can be used with CSGO. Pressing Ctrl, Shift, and S to save this as a new file. We'll want to change our file type to D3D DDS. Save this as DE underscore Metro underscore Radar. If we click Save, we'll get a prompt to choose the format. We want to use DXT1 ARGB 1-bit alpha. Click Save, and that's complete. Do the same thing to the second file, except we want to name this one lower. So DE underscore Metro underscore lower radar. We can see that name from our template. If we click save, we'll once again choose the same template. There's one more image that I want to create. This is the spectator image that will be displayed to spectators of the game and on the loading screen. If you don't create a spectator image, it will use the default image instead. If we go to image and duplicate, we can just make a simple change, which will consist of me putting the map information at the top. If we press Control shift s again to save this, D3D, and its map name is now going to be DE underscore Metro underscore Radar underscore Spectate. Click Save, the same preset. And now let's minimize everything and copy these from our desktop to our games directory. Opening up our CSGO location, which is Steam, Steam Apps, Common, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, CSGO, go to the Resource folder, Overviews. If we copy these three files in, we can see that we have our radar text file and the three images. Let's load the game and then type map and then our map name. We can see that we have the overview here with the spectate one along with the terrorist and counter-terrorist icons with A and B bomb site. When we click continue and join a team, we have our radar file here as well up in the top left. If I go down to the lower area, we can see that the file just changed as we broke the negative 16 unit. This results in the top area being faded out and the bottom area being highlighted. That's going to wrap it up for today. I hope you enjoyed learning how to make a radar. Thanks for watching. Join us again tomorrow for the next one.